Garvey not only promised the despised Negro a paradise on earth, he also made him an important person in his immediate environment. James Thornhill, a British seaman, was a captain in the African Legion. I'd come here from England, and uh, when I come here, I, I heard him lecturing about Africa. So I got interested and stopped. He said, I would like you to give you uh, some of the documents of the, of the organization to take with you. And wherever you go, whatever country you go in, you give them to black people. But not all black people were receptive to Garvey's message. The established leaders of the black communities, preachers, ward politicians, and the small, aggressive middle class of blacks rejected his ideas. They despised his followers and ridiculed Garvey. He was openly attacked by the oldest organization of black Americans, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Its president, W.E.B. Du Bois, scoffed. When Mr. Garvey brought his cohorts to Madison Square Garden, clad in fancy costumes and with new songs and ceremonies, and when ducking his dark head at the audience, he yelled, we are going to tell England, France, and Belgium to get out of Africa. America sat up, listened, laughed, and said, here at least is something new. We're not asking black people to go out on the streets to fight in order that a few people can reap the rewards, the so-called middle class. Now, these middle class are entirely selfish people. They were concerned with the fact that they had achieved status here. Garvey knew that Harlem loved colorful parades, and none of them was so full of pomp and pageantry as the annual convention of the UNIA. Thousands of delegates from all over the world marched through the streets carrying banners and flags. The UNIA Music Corps led the parade followed by the African Legion, the African Motor Corps, the Black Cross nurses, and then came the thousands of members of the UNIA and followers. With the exception of the white dresses of the Black Cross nurses, the members of all the other militant organizations were clad in extravagant uniforms in the red, black, and green colors of the UNIA. However, the main attraction of every parade was the self-appointed provisional president of Africa himself, Marcus Mosiah Garvey. Within a few years, Garvey had managed to organize the largest mass movement for blacks that had ever existed. His claim that the UNIA had more than two million members may have been slightly exaggerated, but was not improbable. His followers were mostly simple people who found consolation and purpose in belonging to the proud African nation whose greatness Garvey promised would soon be restored. Garvey taught the black peoples of the Americas to have self-respect and to be proud of their appearance, their race, and their African motherland. These concepts have formed the ideological basis of all the black militant organizations that followed the UNIA, from the Black Panthers to the Black is Beautiful movement. Garvey even influenced such African nationalists as Jomo Kenyatta and Kwame Nkrumah as well as the student struggles in Soweto. Garvey called to the crowds, Sons and daughters of Africa, I say to you, arise, 
take on the toga of race pride and throw off the brand of ignominy which has kept you back for so many centuries. Dash asunder the petty prejudices within your own fold. Set at defiance the scornful designation of nigger uttered even by yourselves and be a Negro in the light of the pharaohs of Egypt. The Universal African Royal Guard. This covered one God, one aim, one destiny. It covered everything that a nation should be, a people. Mr. Garvey knew, like Lincoln, that we couldn't be a nation within a nation. But he kept asking, where are our kings? Where are our generals? Where are our presidents? Where are our ships? Where are our anything? Garvey founded a number of business enterprises, but the one that seemed to mark the realization of his dreams was the Black Star Line, the shipping line that was exclusively owned by small black shareholders to carry passengers and cargo between Africa, the Caribbean, and the United States. Many believe that the Black Star Line was the beginning of a huge fleet that would one day carry the descendants of the slaves back across the Middle Passage to Africa. Garvey was not a businessman. His partners were unreliable, and the ships that were bought by the organization were scarcely seaworthy. The Black Star Line was the climax of Garvey's attempt to create a black economic empire. However, Garvey never questioned whether it was possible to achieve economic and cultural independence from white society by simultaneously copying its codes and ethics. This was the major contradiction in his thinking. In 1923, Garvey was falsely charged with using the United States mails in an attempt to defraud. And when they, when they went to trial, they struck uh, Judge Julian Mack and they struck Attorney Merrick. They, uh, they offered Mr. Garvey $15 bail and he said not fifteen thousand dollars of my money but nickels and dimes of black people before I should I, I should see this money go into the hands of the white man I rather the walls of all federal prison crumbling upon a black neck in 1924 Garvey lost his case and was sentenced to five years in prison. He was paroled after two and a half years and deported to Jamaica. Garvey's radical ideas and organizational talents had made him many enemies in the United States. Not the least of them was the U.S. Department of Justice itself, which regarded Garvey's militant organization with suspicion and hoped that it would fall apart without its charismatic leader. Marcus Garvey arrived back in Kingston in 1927. He got a hero's welcome. It was the biggest crowd that Kingston had ever seen. Garvey began almost immediately to reorganize the local UNIA. His convention hall, Liberty Hall, once stood on this now empty lot on King Street. Directly across the way was the Da Costa restaurant where he often had lunch. The situation in Jamaica was different from that in the United States, Garvey noted. The sleeping West Indian has ignored his chance ever since emancipation. The Negroes of the West Indies need a terrific sensation to awaken them to their racial consciousness. In his cultural center, Edelweiss Park, today a parking lot, Garvey tried to encourage a new black local culture. At Edelweiss Park, we had the usual divisional operations. We had the Boy Scouts, the Girl Guides, and such things. And in all that, yours truly was very active. I